Good morning, the House Criminal Justice Committee will come to order. Would the clerk please take attendance? Chair Holt. Yes. Representatives Andrews. Here. Carter. Present. Green. Young. Here. Arbit. Devendorf. Cernoglu. Here. Filler. Yes. Mueller. Here. Sass. Yes. Present. Harris. Here. Pagol. Here. Madam Chair, you have 10 members present. You do have a quorum. Thank you. Representative Cernoglu moves to adopt the minutes from the April 11th meeting. Without objection, the minutes are adopted. We'll start this very busy meeting with a presentation from the Michigan Association of Treatment Court Professionals. Please go ahead and get started when you're ready. Thank you, Representative Hope and members of the House Criminal Justice Committee. My name is Kate Hoody. I am the Executive Director of the Michigan Association of Treatment Court Professionals. We are a statewide association based here in Lansing. I was supposed to be joined today by our Legislative Director, retired sobriety court judge, uh, Judge Harvey Hoffman, um, but he was ill this morning, so he sends his regrets. We certainly appreciate the time to present on our association and give you some uh, more information on Michigan's treatment courts, as well as some legislation. Um, as I stated, we are the statewide association for all of the treatment courts, and we were founded um, back in 1996. Our mission is to provide leadership to our treatment courts in the state of Michigan. We have a very large board representing diverse professions and geographic areas across the state. This is our executive committee. And then here are all of our members at large. So we have judges, defense attorneys, prosecutors, uh, substance use disorder and mental health professionals, um, probation, community corrections, and many more. Treatment courts quite simply save lives, reduce crime, and save money. And I'm, I'll get into some more specifics here. Um, but just some backing up background, what are treatment courts? They are referred to as problem-solving courts by the State Court Administrative Office, which is the administrative arm of the Michigan Supreme Court. SCAO does have a problem-solving courts division, and um, Supreme Court Justice is assigned as our problem-solving courts liaison. Currently, that's Justice Bolden. Uh, we work very closely with the Problem Solving Courts Division. What are treatment courts not? They are not separate courts. They are simply specialized dockets that judges at both the district and circuit court level maintain in addition to their normal civil and criminal dockets. And also just another note about specialty courts across the state. There are a number of specialty court programs. Uh, for example, the Human Trafficking Court in Washtenaw County, Baby Court in Genesee County, uh, the Jobs Courts. These are not treatment courts, though. Treatment courts are concerned with both crimes involving drugs and alcohol and or crimes that are committed by individuals with a substance use disorder and or mental health disorder. In a treatment court, the defendant is referred to as a participant, and we accept those with high risk and high needs in treatment courts. So not everyone that's charged with a substance use offense is eligible for or should be in a treatment court program. And in fact, national research shows that those who may be low risk or low need, if they are mixed in with a high risk, high need population, that can be detrimental to those high risk, high need participants. Generally, in a treatment court, our participant has already been convicted of a crime and is sentenced to intensive supervision by the treatment court. A distinguishing factor of treatment courts is the team approach to helping a participant. The team will meet weekly to discuss participant progress, and those are referred to as team meetings or staffings. So that's going to be the judge, prosecutor, defense attorney, treatment providers, a case manager, program supervisor, probation. Uh, peer recovery coaches, law enforcement, um, and a number of other individuals. 
Research also shows that judges who participate in treatment courts have um, higher effects of lowering recidivism. Uh, so judges are truly key to helping our participants in treatment courts. Services for a participant in a treatment court can run the gamut, but some examples are listed here. Usually it's drug testing, some sort of ongoing treatment, perhaps medication for opioid use disorder, 12-step programs like AA or NA, peer recovery coaches, therapy, trauma-based care, parenting classes, education, job, housing assistance, and overall physical and dental care. Services should be more than simplify, simply satisfying the checklist, however, they need to be individualized to the needs of the participant. Treatment court programs typically follow three separate phases. Each phase lasts approximately four months, with most program completions happening between 12 to 18 months. During the first phase, which is the most intensive phase, participants are meeting with their probation officer and appearing before the judge weekly. This consistent accountability is really key to helping somebody move forward in the program. And completion of a treatment court will culminate in a graduation. And here are some really wonderful pictures from some of our treatment court graduations in Wayne County and Jackson County. So how many problem solving courts or treatment courts do we have across the state now? Well, we are one of the leaders in the nation. Uh, we have 208 treatment courts across the state of Michigan. We touch pretty much every county, and even those counties that don't have a treatment court in it likely are being served by one of our regional courts. Out of those 208 treatment courts, we have 137 drug and sobriety treatment courts, and those are further broken down into hybrid DWI and drug courts, DWI or sobriety courts, juvenile drug, adult drug, which is at the circuit court level, our family dependency courts, and tribal healing to wellness. We have 43 mental health courts right now, 35 adult and eight juvenile. And then we are the leader in the nation for the number of veterans treatment courts that we have at 28. Our treatment courts, another distinguishing factor is that they have to be certified. Um, our association, along with SCAO, wrote the best practices and standards for treatment court certification, and it went into effect in 2017. In order to be eligible for state grant funding, a treatment court must be certified. And they have to follow these best practices and standards. Here's just a quick reference of our statutes that we currently have for drug treatment courts, mental health, juvenile mental health, and veterans treatment courts. We work uh, with many different state agencies as well as state associations. So here's just a short listing of who we work with. And one of the big components to our association is education. We host a large annual conference every year, bringing together eight to 900 treatment court professionals from around the state. We also travel annually to the Upper Peninsula, and we conduct regional trainings across the state. We also uh, publish some resources. We have a drug testing manual that we have published, as well as some additional resources, uh, this resource of resources uh, that we put together in conjunction with SCAO. One of our other uh, programs that we're very proud of, and if Judge Hoffman was here, he could definitely um, speak to this much better than I can since uh, this was his brainchild many years ago, but uh, we have been involved with a treatment court housing pilot for individuals with opioid use disorder in treatment courts. Uh, this started back in, gosh, 2016. Uh, Governor Snyder um, gave the green light to do a pilot with MISHTA, um, and they created a new class of permanent supportive housing to meet the needs of people in treatment courts with an OUD or SUD. And our very first uh, treatment court uh, housing pilot location opened up uh, in Andy's place in Jackson. If you have um, heard of it, uh, we worked on that along with MISHTA and a number of other organizations. 
And Andy's Place has been extremely successful. All of the uh, residents of Andy's Place are those who are in treatment court programs in Jackson, Lenaway, Hillsdale counties. Uh, we have some other ongoing projects and applications have been submitted for low income tax credits um, for uh, residents in Southfield and Midland County and there's also discussions for developments in West Michigan and Southwest Michigan. Legislatively, we have a number of efforts that we have reintroduced from last session, and thanks to many of you on this committee, um, we are really excited to see these move forward. Um, House Bill 4522, which would create the Family Treatment Court Act. Right now, our family treatment courts, we only have eight in the state, um, but right now they're operating under the Drug Treatment Court statute. They do not have their own statute. And that's not always the best place for them to be operating under because family treatment courts are civil cases. These are uh, for abuse and neglect matters. And uh, the drug treatment courts are obviously criminal cases. So this would help to codify our existing programs, give them their own statute, uh, which would then allow us to write uh, best practices and standards specifically for those family treatment courts. House Bill 4524, uh, which uh, right now, if a participant is convicted of a felony after admission into a treatment court, uh, this would allow some discretion to continue the participant in the program. And this was an ask directly from our courts. They wanted to have the flexibility to allow somebody to continue on in the program. Um, and then we have... Um, some expansion of the violent offenders language for mental health courts and other treatment courts. Um, this would allow people who had previously been convicted of uh, perhaps an assaultive crime in the past. Right now they would likely be barred entry into a treatment court, but this would allow them with discretion by the judge and prosecutor in consultation with any known victim to perhaps have a chance to be in a treatment court program. And then finally, our Senate bills um, would expand our existing ignition interlock program that we have for sobriety court participants. It would, <coughs> excuse me, it would expand it to mental health court and veterans uh, treatment courts as well. And here's our contact information. Thank you so much. It looks like we do have some questions from committee members. You're up there? No? Oh, okay. You did such a thorough job. There are no questions. Um, please note that this presentation will be in the minutes on the committee website. And please give uh, Judge Hoffman our best. Uh, he was missed. Thank you. Thanks. And now we will hear testimony from Representatives Breen and Bazaar on House Bills 4438 and 4439. Go ahead and get started when you're ready. Thank you, members of the committee. We also have, uh, I'll be very quick today, we have some people here in the room to testify as well as some people on Zoom. And this is a very set of simple bills. We simply are trying to give the same uh, collective bargaining rights to corrections officers as their fellow counterparts in public safety. Um, unlike their counterparts on the road or elsewhere, county correction officers do not have the right to binding arbitration, yet they are prohibited from striking which I, th I think we can all agree. Thank you, Rep. Arbit, for telling me I'm not being loud enough. Um, they are prohibited from striking. That would obviously be a public safety disaster. We already have a shortage of public safety employees. This is a method to try also to lure people into this occupation. And um, this is an efficient way to allow uh, employees and employers to come to a resolution with collective bargaining. It's uh, expeditious and it can actually save money. 
I know often actually counties will come up on the positive end, if you will, when it comes to binding arbitration, but I'm going to let my colleague, Representative Bazat, speak, and then I think the other people that we have on Zoom and here in the audience will be able to offer some additional information. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the committee. Um, good morning. I would like to thank the Chair and Criminal Justice Committee for holding this hearing on this package of bills. My bill, House Bill 4439, is a tie-barred companion bill which makes changes to PA 312, 1969, and makes arbitration for local police officers and firefighters agenda neutral. The changes within these two bills will make much-needed improvements on how local sheriff's departments, deputies serving as corrections officers, will have access to arbitration already available to other dep deputies working for the department. As a county sheriff, I was able to witness how corrections officers, especially during recent years, have become a specialized group of individuals dealing with a multitude of prisoner activity and technical knowledge, which needs constant monitoring and attention for the safety of everyone within the walls of our jails, both prisoners and employees alike. Historically, our local corrections officers have been subject to compulsory arbitration until changes were made back in 1984 under President Reagan. Over time, new changes were made for police and fire personnel, but not for corrections. Today, we have the opportunity to make these needed changes and treat our corrections personnel the same as others working for local departments. My personal experience, Madam Chair, was 19, around 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2014, uh, as the sheriff in Livingston County, our, our deputies and, and corrections are in the same union. And for 40 years, any time we went to arbitration, they, uh, they were treated the same. Uh, during my time, I was the union president uh, from the, in the early 80s for about five or six years. And we really didn't like to go to arbitration because we were one in five. We won one out of, out of five arbitrations. So it's, it's not that we, we think we want to go to arbitration on every case. But in 2014 or so, for the first time in 40 years, the uh, county commission decided, after, after a language in the contract allowed deputies to go f for a 2% uh, COLA increase. And they won that case, obviously, because the cost of living was up that year. But anyway, uh, for the first time in 40 years, they excluded the corrections officer, which I thought was totally uncalled for and unfair. So I've been trying to get this changed uh, for the last nine, 10 years. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Appreciate the chance to talk to you guys today. Thank you, and if committee members uh, will indulge, please hold your questions until we're done on these bills, if you don't mind. Uh, next, we have some folks representing the Police Officers Association of Michigan. If they wanna come up together, Please introduce yourself and get started when you're ready. Hey guys. Sure. Morning, Madam Chair, honorable members. Uh, my name is Dave LaMontagne. I work for the Police Officer Association of Michigan. I represent um, thousands of corrections officers across the state. Uh, Ryan Steverson uh, is uh, one of those folks. I'm here in support of him and in support of this bill. Good to see you. Good morning, Madam Chair and uh, honorable individuals. Uh, this is my first time speaking. Can everyone hear me? Uh, I started in corrections uh, eight years ago for Jackson County. Uh, I live in Summit Township, which is in the county. Uh, in my time there, I've went through two contracts. Uh, the first contract I went through, I wasn't on the union board. Um, while we were uh, negotiating, our union president at the time uh, turned down uh, a lot of ideas that we had based off the fact that we didn't have binding arbitration. Uh, I didn't like that we were getting turned down prior to even going, so I stepped up. I uh, took over as the union president, uh, and then I got a first-hand feel exactly how that goes. Uh, our counterpart has 312 arbitration. 
Uh, we always went off kind of the backing that when we uh, go and arbitrate on certain matters, when the road goes first, uh, usually correction follows and will receive the same that they get. Uh, this year, uh, they took it all the way to arbitration. They won on several matters, uh, increase in pay, uh, increase in PTO, and such. Uh, we followed suit, hoping that we would get the same uh, that our road patrol received. Uh, the sheriff was on board with us getting, and the county uh, chose not to give us the same as our fellow comrades. Uh, I am in full support of this bill passing. I uh, hope that kind of helps out a little bit. If you guys have any questions. Okay, like I said, we're going to hold <laughs> questions until the end of the presentation, but uh, thank you for your testimony. And we have uh, Sheriff Raphael Washington on Zoom. And we may or may not have Sheriff Michelle LaJoy Young joining us as well. Good morning, Madam Chair and members of the committee. By way of introduction, my name is Raphael Washington, and I am the elected sheriff for Wayne County. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you this morning about a topic that is very important to me, and that is the attainment of collective bargaining rights for correction officers. I intend to keep my remarks brief as I have a scheduled engagement that coincides with this testimony today. So correction officers are often the forgotten stakeholders in our criminal justice system. They play a critical role in that they are responsible for the maintenance of conditions that provide for the health, safety, and welfare of inmates, both pre and post conviction, and that are in the care and the custody of our county jails. These components are necessary for the provision and maintenance of constitutionally complainant conditions of confinement. Oftentimes, correction officers do not have the right to collectively bargain the terms and conditions of their employment. Yet they are working side by side, performing the same duties as licensed police officers. In Wayne County, correction officers and police officers that work in his jails do have the right to collective, collectively bargain, but that is not a right enshrined in law. I believe it should be. I am hopeful that there will be a part, bipartisan recognition of this need and that is this committee will vote on House Bill 4438 and 4439 out to the floor for passage and to both ultimately being signed into law by the governor. So thank you again for allowing me to share my position on this extremely important matter. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sheriff. And now we'll open it up to questions if members have any questions regarding these bills. Seeing no questions? I, I do. Okay. Uh, Representative Carter? Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Good morning. I'm wondering how many sheriff's departments have dual classifications? Uh, that's a pretty good question. Um, I couldn't give you that answer offhand. I will tell you that, uh, you know, when I first started in 73, when we came in, you know, based on seniority, we were assigned to the jail or road patrol. We could do both jobs, uh, but as time has gone on, especially the corrections now, they have to go to an academy, they have to have ongoing training, the technology, and the, as you know, you've, you've worked in, the, in that area, but deputies can no longer go into the jail and, and do that job. So you, what you have now is you, you technically can, they can go on strike. So who's gonna run the jail? Because deputies are, are gonna have a tough, tough time going in there and running the jail. But I, I couldn't give you, a, out of the 83 jails, I couldn't give you that breakdown. Uh, Re I reason I asked, you touched on it, and like you said, I retired from the Sheriff's Department. I was a union vice president. We had one classification, and it was interchangeable. <coughs> and we were subject to 312. So I was curious as to, you know, how many departments, and is there a pathway? And I know some have corrections, some have, you know, road or, or court. Is there a pathway for corrections to go to the other side through the academy? I know, I know that it used to be MCOLs. I know the Michigan Sheriff's Association has something now, too, for corrections. Did that impact their ability to go to 312? And, and I'll tell you here, I'm for 312 because if they strike, it will be a public safety issue. Right. But um, I don't understand 
Well, maybe, maybe that's another issue, not yours. <laughs> don't worry I, about it. Don't I, worry about it. I got it. To answer your last question there, I, I would do whatever I could to recruit out of the jail to bring them to the road. But it really had nothing to do with, uh, I was looking for good quality people that were invested in Livingston County. And so it had nothing to do with the arbitration, 312 arbitration issue. And I think moving on, an easier fix would be one classification with tiers. There you go. Representative Begole. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I'd just like to say uh, I'd like to applaud Representative Breen and Bazat's uh, bringing this forward. It, it is extremely important as a, a former county sheriff. It's 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And uh, in the past, we always had 312 binding arbitration, and they were cut off there. And so I think uh, to a certain extent it's bred a lot of animosity. Um, they're there through snowstorms, everything. I mean, it's, uh, it's a good worthy effort, and I appreciate you guys bringing it forward. Madam Chair, if I could add one thing. Uh, this bill, I think it was 4725. Uh, Rep. Breen and I have worked on this bill now for two plus years, and it passed out of, out of the House last, uh, last session, 97 to 10, and it passed through the Senate unanimously, Judiciary Committee. So it just didn't quite make it to the end, but we're hoping to get that done this year. Last chance for questions. Thank you, representatives, and thank you to the others who uh, testified on these bills. Before we move on to another topic, I have some cards I need to read in here. Mike Sauger, mm -hmm. president of the Michigan Fraternal Order of Police supports 4438 and 4439, does not wish to speak. Steve Del Delay from the Mackinac Senate for Public Policy opposes 4438 and does not wish to testify. Madeline Fada from the Michigan Association of Counties opposes 4438 and does not wish to testify. And then the Michigan Sheriff's Association, Matt Saxton, supports the bills and does not wish to testify. Now we're going to move on to... Uh, our next topic, and I just wanted to say a couple of things since uh, this is a pretty big issue. Um, I want, want to make sure that everyone talks with respect and, and consideration for one another. We're going to keep it civil. Um, this is a emotionally fraught issue, and it's also a fairly legally complicated issue. So we will take our time going through this testimony today, and if we need to come back um, and revisit this at our next committee meeting, we will do that. Representative O'Neill and Representative Vanderwall. And Representative Wilson, you're welcome to join if you if you wish. Are you are you going to stay on the dais? Or? I guess I'll join. Okay, thank you. Sure. <laughs> Whenever you're ready, representatives. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of this Criminal Justice Committee. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm here today to testify on the Juvenile Life Without Parole package and talk about the opportunities we can create for our youth. Michigan has more juvenile sentenced to life without parole than any other state. This is unacceptable. 26 states already have laws on the books banning life without parole, 
while seven others have ju no juveniles serving such hard sentences. House Bills 4660 through 4164 and Senate Bill Comparison Bills 119 through 123 would eliminate life without parole for youth under the age of 19. This legislation aligns with Michigan juvenile sentencing laws with those of the majority of states in our country. It aligns Michigan juvenile sentencing laws with what is fair and merciful. These bills provide a minimum sentence of 10 years and a max that is no more than 60 years for certain crimes. The packages will allow for a parole review after 10 years of time served. This 10 years review process will take into consideration many factors of the crime and deciding the juvenile's access to parole. Some of these factors include age, maturity, family home environment, circumstances of the offense, such as their role in the offense and if a peer pressure was a factor in the crime. i also like to point out, Madam Chair and colleagues, that it costs the United States around $2.5 million a year to imprison a juvenile serving life without parole. However, but that price tag for the state shouldn't really matter when it comes to the price that these children are paying. Their lives, lost opportunities for a second chance. The law clearly distinguishes children from adults. The research shows that. This is why ending juvenile life without parole is necessary. These are kids. I can't stress enough the importance this legislation means. It's the difference between life behind bars and the opportunity for redemption, grace, and mercy that all of us at one point in time have benefited from. The state should provide the necessary help, for, help resources, and training for these young people to reenter society. We must move from a more punitive, focused correction system to one that is centered around restorative justice. Just because a child committed a crime doesn't guarantee they will make the same mistake and commit another crime. A duly knowing point, the recidivism rate for a juvenile that leaves the system is less than 1%. And many of my colleagues know that we've introduced these bills before just last term. Many of my colleagues also know that I'm a strong proponent for criminal justice reform, as you are. So I come before you today, Madam Chair and colleagues, to finally move this legislation, hopefully across the finish line, to give it a real chance on the floor. I will add, without this legislation that we're speaking of today, uh, it, it takes away the opportunities for these kids to have a second chance. The price, the place in society, the price they pay is with their life, and their chance for change. And it's time, I met Madam Chair, that we take bigger steps as a state and be more effective in terms of our reforms as relates to criminal justice in the state of Michigan. Thank you for this time and appreciate the opportunity. Representative Vanderwall. Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, speak before you today. It's impossible to talk about these bills without talking about the word justice. House Bills 4160 through 64 changes sentencing guidelines so that juveniles cannot be sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. This is a concept I have agreed on with for several years and have worked on multiple terms. Obviously, most juveniles who commit a crime aren't facing a life sentence. So the portion of the young people currently could face a life sentence is limited to those who commit extremely serious offenses. It's important to have balanced justice when engaging in these hard conversations. The justice we seek is to bring with these bills is preventing someone whose brain isn't even fully developed from being punished for a mistake that they made as a kid for the rest of their lives. However, justice is also warranted for the families. 
of the victims of these crimes. And while crafting any legislation, we must make sure that we bring them to justice as well. That's why I've been working with, on substitutes for these bills that I, have made, I will make available for the committee members that hold both these concepts in balance. I will explain some of the highlights. The current version of the bills allows a juvenile who would currently be given a life sentence to get a maximum of 10 years before they become parole eligible. My, substitute, my substitutes would raise this to 25. As stated before, the human brain doesn't fully develop until 25 years of age. So as a 14-year-old who commits a mass murder would be a parole eligible before the brain is fully developed, we must ensure that these children have the appropriate amount of time to learn, improve, and work towards becoming a productive and safe member of society. My substitute would also do away with the leniency for children who murder multiple people or shoot up, for example, a school in the wake of, the, in the wake of Oxford School. Now it is appropriate time to be offering judicial leniency to the perpetrators of such senseless violence. The families of these victims must have justice. I'm happy to answer any questions on these bills or on the substitutes, but I really appreciate the opportunity to bring these bills forward and to work with you to make sure that we do what's right for everybody in this state. Good morning and thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I just wanted to share something that just happened recently. So some of you know we've been dealing with the death of my family and we were preparing some teenagers. And my 25 year old took his two cousins, a 17 and 18 shopping. And he simply gave them two instructions. We need shirts with buttons <laughs> because all they want to wear t-shirts everywhere and we're getting ready for a service, and pants with zippers because all they want to wear are joggings, right? Every single time they were shopping, they showed up with a shirt without buttons <laughs> and pants without zippers. And he said, what are you guys doing? And my son is 25 and he's just like, he couldn't believe it because simple concepts to kids are simple concepts. It was shirts, with buttons and pants with zippers. And they couldn't even comprehend that. Can you imagine doing something, create, committing a heinous crime at these young ages and really grasping what it means? They're not thinking. And so when I look at this package of bills, I'm thinking about the grace and I'm thinking about the mercy and I'm thinking about what we call our prison system, we, we continue to call it corrections, but I'm wondering when we're ever gonna put forth some, some real work on helping people correct wrong actions, particularly these young people. I believe they should be given a chance. I don't believe this is a saying that nobody should, you know, we're being soft on crime, I'll just say it. I don't think that's what we're doing. We're showing grace, and we're showing mercy, and we're also looking at the fact that children's minds have not developed <laughs> enough to really be able to comprehend what it is that they've done. So as my good colleagues have already said, I'm hoping that even with, you know, as we continue to discuss substitutions and amendments and all of that, that the work that's been done will finally be able to get this across the line and that our babies will be able to have the second chance that they need. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, committee, for uh, having this hearing. Uh, I'll be brief. Uh, I think that um, there's a couple facts that have already been touched on in regards to uh, the mind developing at a young age, and it hasn't really truly developed until age 25. Uh, that's one piece. Uh, the second piece is there's been plenty of studies that have shown uh, that people age out of crime. And uh, when we're talking about these teenagers, um, the recidivism rate, which Rep O'Neill touched on, is so low, 1% uh, or less, uh, when we're talking about these teenagers. Um, so I think when we're talking about um, grace and mercy, as uh, Rep uh, Young uh, stated, I think that's very important to uh, keep in mind uh, as this legislation moves through the House. 
uh, also, uh, like Rep. Young stated, is that there was a crime that was committed. There still needs to be uh, punishment. And we have a certain amount of years on here. And when you look at the maximum amount of years, uh, we're literally talking about someone potentially uh, getting out when they're a senior citizen. Uh, clearly, someone who is not going to be uh, a threat to society. So keeping in mind that we're talking about teenagers, juveniles, um, uh, this is why I support this legislation. Thank you. Thank you. We do have several questions, and I assume they're all for the bill sponsors. Uh, Representative Filler? Yeah, so I'm, I'm reading this. Uh, the Oxford school shooter, Ethan Crumbly, is going to be sentenced in the next month. The Oakland County prosecutor is asking for life without parole. Uh, it may be granted because of the heinous nature. But if the bill package becomes law, Ethan could be let out of prison in 10 years if the parole board decided. And they take a look at the following things under House Bill 4160. Individuals age and immaturity. I mean, he's 15. Of course, he's going to be immature, right? Individuals, family, and home environment. And uh, a lot of us are very clear that um, they had a bad home environment. So he seems like a, a, a pretty good candidate to be let out in 10 years. I find that unconscionable. I find that unconscionable for the victims, uh, for the community that was terrorized. I just want to make sure I'm reading this correct, that, that your bill package would let out or allow the parole board to possibly let out Ethan Crumbly in 10 years. If I can answer that for you, uh, Representative Filler, I, I appreciate the comments. And yes, that's exactly the way the bill currently is written. And that is why we are currently working on a substitute that would address that situation. Um, it wouldn't be fair to the victims, and it certainly is a young man uh, that committed that crime. We need to look at making sure that uh, that is extended. So uh, I look forward to making sure that you see those substitutes, and I believe you'll see that it's addressed. Representative Arbit. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, sponsors. Um, I do have a question about, um, actually, first, I wanted to um, uh, just give a shout out to uh, my constituent, Ronnie Waters, who has been uh, a very uh, vocal advocate and uh, help on, on this legislation. Um, I, I want to discuss like the difference between 10 and 25 and where that difference comes from and what sort of you know stakeholders you've been working with to sort of get at like what is just and what is fair because it's you know kind of a, a nebulous concept and understanding you know what are you know the sort of uh, metrics by which we are you know trying to uh, you know put in place to understand what is the right timeline for that appreciate that uh, representative Arbit I, again it, it it comes with working with stakeholders working with lawyers um, and really uh, studying the uh, the human brain and we understand that it doesn't fully develop until they're after 25 if somebody create or commits this crime we need to look at each one um, especially when you look at some of the the heinous crimes as uh, were explained earlier that uh, we're looking at a mass murder um, we need to address that address that and we need to make sure as I said earlier that uh, the victims are also uh, brought to justice but also the young people that create this, or the criminal, yes, mm -hmm. that uh, um, create this problem um, are looked at and properly punished, but also rehabilitated. I guess my question is more of like, okay, so if someone commits a crime at 15, then the 10 years would be to 25, then, or if it was, you know, 19 or 20, and then it's, you know, then you get to 20, then you're all there and you're 45 years old, right? And so I guess my question is, is there potentially another way than doing, you know, sort of a one size fits all um, sort of uh, eligibility period um, after which, you know, someone is eligible for parole and sort of having either a, a series of standards or sort, sort of like, you know, if you're this age, when you like, you know, I mean, I, I really think that that's that's my hesitation is a, is a one size fits all. And I think it may be more complicated and it may be be uh, you know a lot more effort to sort of figure out what that looks like but to me it might actually ha be more effective and sort of better be able to balance the needs both of 
you know, our, our public safety, uh, the needs of, you know, justice for, you know, for victims and victims' families, um, and also not making sure that, you know, individuals who do commit crimes at young ages um, are not sentenced for the rest of their lives. So I would just encourage you to, you all to think a, a little more uh, and I appreciate the work that you have done so far, and I appreciate how hard you guys have worked, you know, for consecutive sessions. But I would encourage you to maybe think outside the box a little bit and maybe move away from the one size fits all to a more, uh, I guess, uh, nuanced approach in, in the eligibility period. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Mueller. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I guess this is to everybody in the bill package. Um, as you can tell, as a former deputy, I'm probably going to be pretty opposed to this. But the one thing that we always tend to forget is the victims. And just recently in my area, a case that I'm very close to, there was a, a woman named Corinne Baker. Uh, her and her boyfriend brutally murdered a young man over three days in the apartment, and she was sentenced. He was sentenced to life without parole. She was sentenced to 13 to 30 years. She was paroled just recently at her first date and communicating with the father, they were never notified. MDOC did not notify the family until it was too late so they could oppose the hearing. And now this woman who stood by while her son, Dominic Calhoun, and now we have Dominic's law, was brutally murdered. And, and the amount of the emotion that it had in our community, you really have to look at victims' input into this. So when the parole board has something, these people cannot be let out of prison until the victims have a say in it. And that they have to be the instrumental part of this whole package, if it's going to go anywhere, is the victims, because they're the ones that don't have their son, they don't have their daughter, they don't have their father. And a lot of times these crimes, as you know, are senseless. All three of us have been to homicides. And when you go into a homicide where there's a six-month-old baby dead, that sticks with you for the rest of your life. A 13-year-old boy in West Willow, 14-year-old boy in West Willow, murdered, shot numerous times as they left the house because he got upset because they shot the dog as someone was hiding in the closet. My partner and I were the first ones to do that. So you have to look at some of the way the crimes are, but there, a lot of them are senseless. And they, they take away someone's life over a pair of tennis shoes, and now you have two people that are, are gone. But I, I'll stop rambling, but the thing is, is you have to have victim input in this. And if the victims don't go along with it, because people can be forgiving. My last day at work, a guy tried killing me and he got sentenced to 12 to 25 years, right? I don't think that's an appropriate sentence for this person. It should have been six to 12, but he refused the plea deal. And now he's serving 12 to 25 years. And I have half a sense to ask the governor to commute a sentence to what it would have been, because that's fair. But I was the victim, I had the input. When you start messing with people's lives like that, you really need to consider the victims. And then I'll get off my soapbox. Sorry. You're not on a soapbox. Thank you. <laughs> no, because we do. The only reason we're having this discussion because there's somebody who committed a crime and there's a victim. And the one thing we don't, I don't believe there's anybody here, any of these bill sponsors who aren't thinking about victims. But we are thinking about what caused the child to create the you know, to do the crime to begin with. We, let's just be honest. My kids would not probably be the ones who we would find having committed one of those crimes that you discussed. But at the same time, they tell me about some of, when they were growing up, about the horrific homes that some of their classmates lived in. I would tell them, they would say, I don't understand why the kid's so bad. And they got in trouble for saying this and saying that, and. One young man came home talking about he just watched the movie Scarface. This was in second grade. So there are reasons why these kids end up violent. There are reasons. And so some of those things need to be taken into consideration. That's all, I think that's what I'm saying. Let's take into consideration some of the backstory where we're looking at this. And then you're right. Uh, there's no reason that families shouldn't be notified when it's time for parole. I, I'm pretty sure parole boards are gonna, I'm hoping they'll do their due diligence. Things clearly seem to happen, but they've got a job to do just like we do. And if they do their job right, if there are areas where we're saying, yeah, this one's just not right, it's just not time, then they won't be let go. Am I looking at this wrong, colleagues? <laughs> hey, Amen. who's next? <laughs> Representative Devendorf. 
Thank you, everybody, for introducing this important uh, package. Um, I speak today as somebody who has worked on homicides uh, as in my role running a victim services organization. Um, I've worked on homicides that are hate crimes, which are, can be the most, some of the most gruesome crimes. Um, and still, I caution us to not continue the pattern of creating policy based on our own frustrations, fears, and anger, and to create, model, pol create models for the rest of the country that show that we have learned what works, what is effective, what will create healing, what will create reform, what will ensure that corrections is actually a place where folks have an opportunity to correct to live um, a better life at some point. With that in mind, I have hesitations about what Representative Arbit brought up in terms of the one-size-fits-all response. I believe that it is counterintuitive to our knowledge of the neurological development and the fact that it is still in process. At, while acknowledging that so many of these things that we would create a carve out for um, are scary things that create a big impact. They can also be huge mistakes. They can also be unwise decisions. They can also happen because you are a part of a group. They can be things that occur because of immaturity and because you are not the person that you can be. And I need us as we have so much power in this space to be, as Representative Young said, considering context, considering the development that can be, and not thinking of some crimes because they are scary and dangerous and hurtful as places where reform can't happen because we are scared and hurt. I hope that we do allow for judicial discretion I hope we do allow for not a one-size-fits-all uh, response to this and that youth can be revisited after 10 years regardless because we know that prison can continue to shape a brain and not in the way that would be conducive to a safer society or a society that will help that individual once they get out. At a certain point, the opportunity and ability to heal hits a wall. For these youth, let's try not to get to that wall. I hope that we reconsider that aspect of this legislation. Representative Begol. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you to my fellow representatives. Um, as I'm sure you know, in 2012, the United States Supreme Court decided Miller versus Alabama. Uh, the Miller Court held that uh, juveniles, those that are under 18 years old, have a diminished culpability and greater prospects for reform when compared to adults. Uh, in 2016, the Supreme Court went even further under Montgomery versus Louisiana. Uh, they held uh, that uh, juveniles sentenced um, that the court case applied retroactively to the, those offenders as well. Since 2012, no offender under the age 18 has received a mandatory life without parole sentence regardless of the circumstances of the, the murder committed. And my question is, um, why would we raise the age from, from what the Supreme Court says now and include the adults? And do you anticipate later on going even further? I know there's been some ages mentioned up to 25 years old uh, that, that uh, the brain is not developed. Representative Carter. Sorry, Madam Chair. Representative, can you... Uh, Kind of refine that, sure, please. I'd be happy to do that. So I'm wondering, wh why would we increase the age 
from what the Supreme Court has said, uh, 18 or below, why would we raise that age to 18, 19-year-olds? That's my first question. And my second question was, do you anticipate that this effort will be extended to even older later on? Because I know there's been some, some talk about the, the brain of, uh, all the way up to a 25-year-old uh, not being fully developed. I will add, if I will, you know, there's a lot of data and research that shows uh, the development, and, and males develop slower than females, that's, that's documented, but the, the brain develops uh, at an exponentially rate higher when they reach that 20, 21, 22, 23, things change. You're not the same person you were at 14 than you are today, right? Just thinking, just right now, and so there may be some discussions. And 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 thinking about the victims, we've we've all considered the victims in this situation. I was at a meeting yesterday, meeting with my superintendents, meet once a month. After that meeting, uh, the waitress came up to me. I didn't know her. She didn't know me, but she knew. Obviously, she knew me because she asked me a question about this bill. We had a terrible case in Saginaw. Karen King was, was brutally murdered, and she was a family member of Karen King. I listened to, to the young lady, and uh, she was in tears, and uh, I, I was calm and patient with her, and I expressed the intent of this bill. And the, the crime that this young man committed was heinous. Now, I, as a state rep and a compassionate person, I, if I was a pro, pro, pro board person, I probably would deny this person's uh, parole. And that's the decision of the parole board. And I trust the, the, the parole board's uh, uh, ability to make those sound decisions. That's why we put them there. Okay? And so those, those are cases that will be decided not because of this bill, but it gives that person a chance to be considered. And that's, I think, and that's what I explained to her. She thought it was just a slam dunk after 10 years, this person's gonna get out. And I said, no ma'am, that's not the case. She said, oh, well, thank you, Rep O'Neill, thank you. And I just wanted to just express to her that a lot of clarity is being shared with a lot of people on this matter, okay, to your point. And so there may be some discussion on ages, but the point being is at that 10 year mark, that just simply says, this package of bills just simply says, these individuals will have a parole, potential for have a parole board hearing. Just like this is a distinguished board of wise people, that parole board is the same. They will make that decision. And when you think about Michigan in, in totality, to my colleagues, the whole system is screwed up in terms of, you know, crime. We support crime. We support, I mean, law enforcement to, to reduce crime. But you look at the whole system. When we make decisions on the House floor, whether to make sure uh, three-year-olds can go to school and, and have early childhood education, or that parent that's working two jobs can have support, child care to make ends meet, those are in totality some of the, the, the cosmics that we deal with as, as a state and representatives when we make decisions. So it's not just we're dealing with this issue right here. The whole system that we have to deal with when we make decisions impact this. So if we start, if we start early and say, let's support those three-year-olds going, going to child care. Let's support early childhood education. Let's support programs that support families when they're trying to make ends meet and working two jobs and living in poverty. This is a, this is a result of the system. And so we're trying to, we're trying to say, hey, Representatives, let's look at how can we be more merciful and give a person a chance to correct their wrongs. We all made mistakes. All of us have. We all had second chances. There's no one in this room and no one listening to my voice has not had a second chance in life. No one. And that's all we're saying. We spend more money in Michigan than any other state for corrections. I'm the chair of corrections. I know more money than any other state, than Mississippi, Louisiana, those, those southern states. Michigan, I'm not proud of that. I'm proud of a lot of things we've done in Michigan, 
but I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of the fact that we, we let our, our inmates spend more time locked up than any other state. I'm not proud of that. I'm not proud of the fact that we don't have any incentives for our inmates while they're in prison to say corrections, reform. I would rather have a person get some information in prison or change their behavior in prison by having an incentive say, well, if I maintain myself, I got good time or, or credits that I can work toward to reduce my sentence. This person's mind is going through a, a process, okay? So this is a big picture, guys. I'm looking at the whole picture. If we want to go that way, we, we don't have time. But the system created this, unfortunately. And I, I am sympathetic to the victims, like the lady that stopped me at the restaurant yesterday. Representative, <laughs> I, I hate to interrupt, but we do have uh, several more representative questions and then several folks who would like to testify. We have uh, about 18 minutes uh, left, and, and it's mathematically impossible for everyone to testify. But I'll take one more question from Representative Carter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative O'Neill, just for the record, I'm on my fifth second chance. So <laughs> as a person who has that background, I actually ran the juvenile detention facility and the youth home and Lincoln, uh, well, for those in Wayne County, know that as the juvenile court. And I got to know some of these young people um, and what we're talking about is root causes. We're talking about getting to the bottom of most of these kids were not bad kids. I've run into a couple that, thank God, they were locked up. But for the most part, they were products of their environment or lack thereof. And so we have to look at this, like you say, big picture holistically. Because I go way back. Um, people in here probably aren't old enough to remember Young Boys Incorporated in the city of Detroit. Okay. And then you're telling your age. But also in 1999... Uh, the state of Michigan charged an 11-year-old as an adult, Nathaniel Abrams, sent him to prison. Um, he was 13 when he got locked up. The system failed him when he was inside. He came out, and he went right back. So we have to look at this. And, and there are victims, and there are some people that want people to rot in hell after they've harmed their loved ones. So we've got to find the balance and try to figure out what kind of society we want to be. So I'm not going to ask a question for the sake of time, but we can have these conversations. Thank you. Madam Chair, I apologize for, for Red. My, my apologies. No, no apology necessary. Um, representatives, if you wouldn't mind holding your questions until perhaps next time or uh, if you feel like it's really urgent for these bill sponsors right now, we can take it. No? Thank you. Um, so next we'll have um, Ronnie Waters from Safe and Just Michigan and Leon Douglas, if you don't mind coming up as well. Good morning, Madam Chair and Committee. Um, my name is Ronnie Waters. Uh, I'm what some people call a juvenile lifer. I was sent to um, prison at the age of 17 for a crime that I definitely committed. I went to prison knowing that I would be punished and punished severely for my actions. Um, that was just afterthought. But when I got to prison, um, I just wanted to try to figure out how to become a better person. Instantly, I wanted to figure out how to become a better person. So many negative things were said about me, and and to my detriment, most of them were true. And but I knew that wasn't who I was, and I went there to try to rehabilitate myself. Even though I was barred from most of the rehabilitative programs, I still was able to to get into a lot of things programs that I was not eligible for because I wanted to be ready in case I ever got a second chance, in case I was ever able to prove um, that I was less culpable than what I was charged with. So everything positive, everything rehabilitated, I did it. I didn't have an out day. I didn't have what some people would call 
a future, but I knew that I had to do things just to make myself better. And in 2012, as someone said, um, Supreme Court changed that for me and said I got a, could have a second chance. It took me 10 years after that 2012 um, ruling to actually get that second chance. And after 40 plus years of imprisonment, I was able to prove that I was rehabilitated, that I was redeemable, that I had value. And I came home and everything I do out here is to prove that I'm redeemable. And I know that people are watching me and I know that I have to be the example for the good people that I left behind. Left a lot of good people behind, and I'm out here advocating for them to also get their second chance because I know these people personally, and I know how important it is for a person who is branded a juvenile lifer to come out and do the right thing. When so many people were saying that you're trash, you're worthless, you're scum, and I rejected all that. I knew that I wasn't. I knew that I could contribute. And thank God that I got a second chance. And thank God that a lot of good people are waiting on that second chance, and maybe they can get it also. Thank you. Sir, please turn on your microphone. Thank you. My name is Leon Douglas. I'm, I'm a, a lifer. I was a lifer uh, without parole. I was given the opportunity and chance of my freedom uh, August of last year. I've, I've been out since then. I've had uh, four jobs. I'm, I'm working as we speak. I've done everything that was, uh, uh, that was available to me in prison that I could do in order to, to better myself. But I, for me to sit here and tell you that it's like I was uh, a model prisoner, I would be lying to you. Uh, I killed a person doing a robbery, and I don't feel good about that. But at the time that I did that crime, I was a blundering idiot. And I admit that, and I didn't have no care or worry about anybody because that's just the way I was, that's the way I felt. During those years in prison, I felt there was no way possible that I could be able to rehabilitate myself and make a change in my life. Well, I'm not going to sit up here and tell you that God came in my life and gave me hope. I'm not going to tell you that. But people gave me hope. People like yourselves. There was a judge that got involved with me by the name of Fred Mester. Some of you people may know him. He got involved with me, and he wanted to help me because he seen the type of individual I was. I did 50 years, and nobody even came to my help. No one other than safe and justice. My friend here, Wani Rodgers, and they came to help me along with Judge Fred Mester, who gave my release. I was given a re-sentence, and I was given 40 to 60 years. I know some of the state representatives feel and believe that some of us are psychopaths, and we don't deserve a chance at freedom. I look at you today, and I say to you today that I deserve a chance. I was sentenced to a death sentence. Year before last, I was given a five-year sentence along and attached to my sentence that I was already doing the time for. They gave me an extra five years saying that it's like they'll see me in five years with the parole board, never seen me except for three times in all the 50 years I was locked up. They wanted me and they gave me an extra five years in other words, I would have been doing 55 years before I would have even been considered being released. I just wanted to know, let y'all know, that it's like I'm here to, be, to support the juvenile with life without parole. And please know and understand, it's like I appreciate all the, the state reps that is fighting for these bills. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to move on to uh, Crystal Gregonis and Michael Sepik. Sepik? And Karen Jackson, please. <coughs> Michael's on Zoom. There he is. Whenever you're ready. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, 
I am Michael Sepik. I retired as the Berrien County Prosecutor at the end of my term in 2020. I was the elected for seven years. So I was the prosecutor during the Sorry, your sound isn't working. Sorry? Can you be louder, please? Oh, sure, sure, I'm sorry. <coughs> so I was the Berrien County prosecutor when Miller came down and when Montgomery came down. Is that better, volume-wise? It's a little better. There might be a problem with your connection, though. It's very faint. <coughs> <coughs> okay, so uh, I uh, Berrien County had 12 juvenile lifers in prison when Miller and Montgomery came down. We filed motions in all those cases. Um, of those 12, we agreed to a term of years in seven. We went to Miller hearings in five. Three of those Miller hearings resulted in a term of years. Two, two different judges sentenced two individuals to life without parole. That was before the Michigan Supreme Court's decisions last summer in Parks and Taylor. So both of those juvenile life without parole sentences have to come back for resentencing. I don't know what will happen to those. But my my uh, the reason I am speaking against these is that it seems to me the legal lay of the land right now allows for Mr. Waters and Mr. Douglas, as we have seen, to have judicial uh, discretion here to decide that if their childhood trauma, their dysfunction in their household growing up contributed to their crime, then judges will give them term of year sentences. I tried a case in 1989, which is one of the two that the judge sentenced to life without parole, a 15-year-old who decided he wanted to kill it was not a robbery, it was not a fight, it was not an argument, it was not, he was not on drugs or alcohol. He wanted to kill, chose his grocery store manager to kill. He was a bagger. Here's a kid who was 15, and contrary to Representative Fuller's statement that if you're 15, you're immature, this 15-year-old had an after-school job, good grades in school, two-parent household, um, Key club member, junior achievement member. He was a star student, uh, one any of us would be proud of, but his brain somehow wanted him to kill, and he did. And Mr. Suffolk. So I, I think Mr. Suffolk. I'm, I'm very sorry to interrupt, but we do have two ladies here who would uh, like to share their stories. Before we conclude, we will be kicked out of this room in about uh, five minutes or less. So I, I hate to interrupt, but. Uh, Sure, one more thing really quickly. Um, let me just say that I think the current lay of the legal landscape permits what you really want to do here. And I think what you really want to do is permit a judge to make that decision. Why don't we trust our judge? Thank you. Ladies. Thank you, Madam Chair and committee members for making time for my testimony here today in opposition to House Bills 4160 through 64 concerning juvenile life without parole, which I'll refer to as JL WAP. My name is Karen Jackson. I'm a co-victim of murder. My son, Jeffrey Ballore, and his female friend, Kristen Pangman, were brutally stabbed to death in a double homicide in 2017. I speak here for myself, my family, and for other co-victims who belong to a group I manage called Voices of Murder Victims. There is little time here to properly convey the depth, severity, and longevity of the trauma we co-victims experience, so I am also providing the clerk with an essay on my personal story to share with all of you. Even with limited time, I would like to recognize our innocent loved ones who were killed brutally and savagely. These victims no longer have a voice or a say in your proposals and decision making. That is left up to us, the co-victims. As co-victims, under the most agonizing of times, we are forced to seek justice for the deaths of our loved ones while picking up the pieces of our own lives and holding together what remains of our broken families. The trauma caused by losing a loved one in such a brutal manner leaves us with a host of issues. One of the most pronounced and the one that I wish to point out today is the lifelong impact on our mental health. 
I know of no co-victim that isn't affected in some way with mental disorders like PTSD, anxiety, depression, and fear. A killer doesn't just take lives, they destroy the ability of whole families to function in healthy, productive ways. The Supreme Court decisions concerning J.L. Wapp have come as a huge blow to what we co-victims recognize as justice. Our assurance that we would never have to fear for our safety, that of our families, and the public has been taken away. Further adding to our trauma is the introduction of these bills. We feel that they lean to the side of leniency for the guilty juvenile murderer while disregarding the impact on innocent co-victims. We oppose legislation that repeals MCL 76925 and 25A and sends incarceration at a set term of 10 to 60 years. A killer having already served more than 10 years of a sentence would be eligible for parole review and subsequent immediate release if approved. We reject any notion that a parole board could deem a killer to be rehabilitated to live in society as justification for reducing sentencing. We do not believe a parole board assessment of the behavior of the killer over a period of years in a closed, regulated environment will guarantee that those behavioral changes will hold true outside of prison. We oppose legislation that removes all possibilities of jail WAP and removes all options to evaluate each case based on its own merits. Although we must respect the, court, the Supreme Court's decision, we do not support any legislation that goes beyond what is necessary to satisfy the Supreme Court's ruling. We ask the committee to acknowledge the continued life struggles and especially the mental health issues of co-victims as paramount to raising our own children and families and living productive and socially accountable lives. We ask the committee to recognize the concerns of innocent co-victims above that of the guilty juvenile murderer. We ask the committee to oppose these bills. Thank you. My name is Crystal Gregonis. On or around September 16th of 2000, my ex-boyfriend threatened to kill me. I moved to a shelter for domestic violence. On October 1st of 2000, he broke into my son's bedroom window. He stabbed my sister several times. He stabbed my brother several times, murdering him. And he stabbed me 15 to 20 times, nearly killing me. My brother's murderer will not serve one day in prison for stabbing me, almost killing me, or my sister, the way the laws are written right now. My brother. <laughs> We all deserve justice. My, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm foggy. My, my head was beat several times that morning. Um, I'm going through physical problems to this day. It's been 22 and a half years and I'm still going through physical problems. I have mental health problems. I'm on several medications and I see therapists, psychiatrists, because I'm scared he's, he's in prison, but I'm still scared he's gonna kill me. It took seven years for me to be able to even sleep alone in my house. 10 years is a pure slap in the face to anybody that's ever been in my position because at seven years, I still felt like he was gonna kill me. He was in prison, I can't, I can't say enough how scary this is. For the past two months, my life has been hell. I got a phone call. Um, we resentenced on May 5th. My ex was sentenced from life without parole. He was 18 years old. He was four days shy of 19. He is now serving 35 to 60 years which means he'll be out in 12 and a half years. That started my seven years again. I, I can't live my life. The day he, he leaves prison is the day that I stop because I'll be watching my back every day because he came to kill me that morning. I, I don't know why we're here. I don't know why we're even discussing people that have already hurt somebody so bad. There are so many other things we could be talking about today. And I don't, I don't, 
I don't understand and I'll never understand this, but I ask that you please, please, when you vote on this, that you think about my life, my brother's life, and my sister. We deserve justice. And he was given that opportunity and he, he, he already did his, made his decision. Thank you. I'm sorry for your loss and I appreciate your willingness to testify. Thank you. Uh, there are several cards that will be recorded in the minutes. There are no absent members. And we will take up this issue again. Um, there being no further business before the committee, the committee will stand adjourned. <laughs>